Take away then, please. I welcome members to the 34th meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and ask members to switch off mobile phones, please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed that we take items 9, 10 and 11 in private. Item 9 will enable the committee to consider further the delegated powers provisions in the Lobbying Scotland Bill at stage 1. Item 10 will enable the committee to consider further the delegated powers provisions in the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Bill. And item 11 will allow the committee to consider a draft report on the transplantation, authorisation of removal of organs, etc. Scotland Bill. Does the committee agree to take items 9, 10 and 11 in private, please? Yes. Agenda item two is the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill, and this is an opportunity for the committee to consider the drafter's response to the committee's questions on the consolidation in parts five to eight of the bill. Do members have any comments, please? Or are we content to note the response and subsequently raise any issues in the normal way? We are, thank you. This brings us to agenda item three, which again is the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill. But uh, this item, we have oral evidence on that bill, and I welcome from the Scottish Law Commission and the Scottish Government, Gregor Clark, who's Parliamentary Counsel of the Scottish Law Commission, and Graham Fisher, who's the Head of Branch 1 Civil and Constitutional Law Division, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, can I just, before we get to questions, um, just take the opportunity of recognising the scale of what you have put before us, um, and also the very small number of questions that we've actually come up with. And I simply want to recognise that, that means an enormous amount of very good work has plainly been done. So beforehand, can I say thank you? Uh, it seems like a good preliminary before we actually move to the one or two questions that we do have. Uh, and I invite questions from members, which I think at the moment is going to be led by Richard. Thank you very thank much, you. Uh, indeed, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my first question is just around the, the general approach you've taken to the drafting of the bill. And firstly, to ask you, were there any overarching aims or principles which informed the drafting uh, approach you've taken to the, to the bill? Uh, the obvious ones of trying to write in plain English, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, not being able to change ab absolutely everything. I, mean, I ju just don't have a total free hand in that. Uh, an attempt at consistency. Um, gender neutrality comes into it, uh, but the, the biggest difficulty was breaking up the really uh, unstructured uh, um, form that the 1985 Act had ended up in. Uh, we've tried to simplify the layout, we've tried to delete unnecessary words. Um, the, uh, there, ha there have been problems in doing that. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, as the committee are no doubt aware, the, we had certain tr difficulties with uh, some words which have a sort of jurisprudence of their own because the courts have been looking at them, uh, how one translates uh, the word forthwith in uh, the, the, the question of uh, uh, when sequestration is constituted, which is an important point. Uh, and so the, it's a, a fine balance sometimes, knowing just quite how to do it and whether consistency should uh, take the, the, the place of uh, um, trying to preserve uh, ex existing uncertainties. You, you mentioned there some, some barriers and challenges you found in applying that, that principle of consistency to the drafting of, of the bill. Uh, were there any other areas in terms of applications or overarching principles where you found challenges and, and difficulties in, in, in achieving those goals? Um, I, I think, I mean, there are obviously there are always challenges in trying to take a very big body of text like this that's been drafted by so many different hands over uh, 30 years. Uh, but I... <laughs> This is, a, this is an administrative process. There, are, I mean, there aren't huge policy issues behind this. It's, it's a process that people are taking through. Uh, and, of course, the, the, the biggest... Uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the biggest advantage of the whole document is that it gives people a, f a fresh start. They, they don't have to concoct their own uh, version of this by starting with the 85 Act and adding each layer as it comes. Uh, they, they, they are presented with a text that now that 
is up to date and is a starting point. No doubt the, the process will go on, amendments will continue to be made, but uh, it should be far simpler for really a long time. Thank you. Um, the convener touched on, 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 the, on this at the beginning of the meeting. This has been an immense uh, task in, in terms of the, 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 the scale of the consolidation which you've undertaken. Uh, in terms of um, achieving that, what, what, um, was there a checking and quality assurance process that was in place to ensure an accurate consolidation that everything you intended to come in to the, um, the parameters of, of this bill was brought in through the con consolidation process, given the fact that you know, we recognise just what a massive task this must have been? Well, of course, I was helped in this by the fact that there have been these um, informal consolidations done on a commercial basis. It gives a starting point. But um, the, essentially, once one has a starting point, everything has to be checked through against um, the, uh, what has happened to provisions of the 1985 Act and in making sure we can justify every provision that's gone into the bill. And the, an attempt is made in the, the tables, there, which are part of the accompanying documents, the tables of derivations and destinations. And although they're a little dense and uh, rather daunting at first glance, by, by working through them, uh, people should be able to focus on a particular section and see if it re where it really has come from and, and whether we can justify it. So it is, it is a sort of audit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convene. That's my um, absolutely, um, what's being said. I just wondered in relation to the informal consolidations that have taken place over the years, given that the consolidation that's before us does a fundamentally different thing, I think, from the informals, in that it's incorporating secondary legislation. Is that something that previously informal consolidations dealt with? Is that a particular benefit of the approach that's being taken, that it's drawing the secondary legislation into that single document? Yes. The, the, I mean, these commercial um, consolidations of the 1985 Act uh, concentrated just on what is currently in the 1985 Act. Um, we, we, we haven't been terribly ambitious in bringing in subordinate legislation. Uh, we have, in essence, gone back to the position uh, before 1997 where uh, the, 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 the provisions um, uh, in relation to protected trust deeds uh, were largely in the Bankruptcy Act itself. They were taken out in 1997 uh, in the main, although the, the, the core provisions were there. I mean, there, there was provision for protected trust deeds. Um, we, we, we have simply brought the material back in, upgraded it, and of course, it's far more than there ever was. It's a very much uh, quite a lot of uh, paragraphs of uh, um, one of the schedules of the bill dealt with what's now in a very large body of text. That's fine. Thank you. John, please. Thanks, Convener. Um, I noticed you said to Mr. Baker that the 85 Act was largely unstructured. Um, obviously, it did have you know, a structure of sorts, and I think it started uh, with the role and functions of the AIB and the trustee and the commissioners and so on, uh, with the process of sequestration coming later on, whereas you've decided to start with the process of sequestration. Can you just explain why you, you've chosen that structure? It, it, it seems... Uh, I, I, first of all, can I just say, I, I wasn't saying that the 85 Act wasn't, uh, was unstructured as it first appeared. I was only saying that over 30 years it, it had lost structure and coherence. Um, the, uh, the, the, the change in order, uh, it just seemed to be the sort of logical way to, to start, not by introducing the cast, as it were, but, but by getting into the sequestration process itself and leaving the rather less important uh, elements uh, till later. Uh, we, we, we haven't, I think, interfered very much with the structure. I mean, with the, uh, um, we start with an application and we go on to a ward of sequestration and so on. It's all, it's, I mean, it is all, I think, uh, fairly logical. Obviously, there are, there are choices to be made as to where you put particular elements, but uh, I think uh, it'd be fair to say that we, we weren't trying to uh, um, be uh, anything other than straightforward in the way we set it out. No, that's fair enough, and presumably, I mean, it doesn't change the substance, the, the order that you actually put the, the different parts in, does it? Uh, no, uh, I, I think you'd be very... Uh, I, I can't think of any way at, at all of which 
putting the things in different order was going to, is going to affect many. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. John, please. Thanks so much. Um, the short title of the bill does not include the word consolidation. In the case of the previous consolidation bill considered by the Parliament, Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Consolidation Bill, the word consolidation was included in the short title. So why is the word consolidation not included in the short title of this bill, please? Well, the, uh, we already have one set of brackets around the word Scotland, and somehow putting in a second set of brackets uh, seems a bit unnecessary. It, I mean, this is, this is not a, a document that's any different, uh, that will be, when it's uh, enacted, uh, any different from any other body of law. Uh, it doesn't have special properties because it's a consolidation, with, with one qualification, which is that uh, uh, the courts need to be aware that it's a consolidation because there are certain rules of construction which then operate. Uh, but uh, that is, I, I think, adequately met by the m reference uh, to, to consolidation in, in the long title. Um, uh, um, sorry, I've, I've rather lost the thread of what I was going to say there. Um, they meant in the long title um, the need for the to draw it to the public's attention that it's a consolidation bill. Yes, that's right. Um, oh, just leave it, leave it at that, sir. I mean, we're perfectly happy with that response, if you I wish. I wonder if it might be it's helpful. And just, just to mention that there are certainly precedents for, for both approaches, both having the consolidation in the, in the short title and to not having the consolidation in, in the short title. So certainly there are, you know, there are Scottish precedents and there are, there are more recent UK precedents for both approaches. And I suppose one, certainly in my mind, and not to speak for, for Gregor in this respect, but, um, but it, I mean, it's a, it's a fundamental part of you know, the bankruptcy acts use day in, day out by practitioners and insolvency. And I suppose even just having a short handle is probably a helpful thing for practitioners, even though that's a, you know, a very simple thing that, that might, might be relevant. Yes, I'm sorry, I have remembered the point I was going to make, which um, is that uh, the, the word consolidation is very useful where there are two acts going through, say, on criminal justice. Uh, and there's going to be, there is a, a criminal justice with a straight programme bill but in the same year, there's a consolidation. So if you, in that instance, it's useful to have the word consolidation there. Otherwise, I'd have thought there was very little need to, to put the word consolidation in, because as far as the practitioner is concerned, this is all the, the, the law which is to be regarded as any other law. OK, thank you. And on a similar but different theme, the bill does not consolidate only the law of bankruptcy. It also consolidates the law and protected trust deeds in Scotland as we heard in oral evidence um, from the EIB and the Scottish Government on the 17th of November, protected trustees are considered to be a major alternative route into insolvency protection, and they are not, however, a form of bankruptcy, but, a rather, but rather a distinct statutory insolvency procedure. So can you explain for the committee why the short title of the bill refers only to bankruptcy? while the bill itself consolidates the law of bankruptcy and the law of protected trust deeds, which is distinct from bankruptcy. I don't know if it's worth, worth me saying something. I think Gregor referred a, a moment ago to the fact that, that in the past, uh, in the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985, the, the, the material on protected trust deeds was, was built into the Bankruptcy Act. Obviously, the, the view was taken then at the time that, that you know, that the protected trust deed material should fall under the, the term bankruptcy. Um, also, you know, you referred to, to what, we, what we said on, on the 17th, and that, you know, that's, you know, that there are probably different ways to, to call different processes, but um, I suppose you, you might say that sequestration as a process, which is sometimes called bankruptcy, um, certainly colloquially, um, and, it, and it is in England, of course, uh, but, but the sequestration process, we certainly distinguish from protected trustees, but arguably, and, and there, there are different ways to argue about this, y y that the protected trustees can, can be accommodated under the term bankruptcy, and that, you know, the view was obviously taken in 1985, that they would cover both processes, and they are both separate and important processes, but that they would cover both under the short title of bankruptcy. So, in a way, the, you know, the bill just takes the approach of replicating that, that position. 
Okay, thank you for that yeah, explanation. The, the, the third point that you, you don't absolutely need to cram everything into the short title. Um, you know, so long as it's not misleading and doesn't give an impression that it's uh, not covering major areas. Um, even if there may be a, a slight difference between, between protected trust deeds and bankruptcy, I mean, the thought was that a, a short, clear title of this kind was not going to, was not going to mislead anyone. Time. Thank you very much. Indeed, with that, <clears throat> thank you. That con conveniently takes me to, to the line that I wanted to pursue because, first of all, can I just confirm that the long title is, as it were, part of the text of a bill for construction purposes? Yes, it is. Yeah. And that does include various acts, as you would expect, and it does say the Protected Trustees Scotland regulations. Yes. And it then says, and related enactments, um, which is fair enough because undoubtedly there is secondary legislation in there which you have brought through. I, I, I think my first question is, on what basis do you believe you have caught everything that should be in related enactments to those? Well, I think um, the starting point always was the 1985 Act, and if the 1985 Act um, uh, is supplemented in some way. We've, we've, we've tried to take account of whatever it is that supplements it. Uh, certainly, um, the, the, uh, it's, it's a huge package. I mean, there's a, there is an enormous amount of material here which um, has been built into the 1985 Act quite deliberately over the years, um, in, in, including the, all this material about pensions, um, uh, an act which isn't in itself about bankruptcy but still impinges very widely on it. Um, we, we've looked at this over really quite a long gestation period. Uh, we, we, we are, nothing has emerged, I think, that um, we, we, we think we've missed in any way. I mean, we, we, we've, uh, <laughs> we've worked through a lot of acts uh, we've uh, worked through a lot of subordinate legislation and uh, there, there may, it's, it may be possible to quibble and say something or other might be in or might not but uh, I, I am confident that we have got the, 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 the bankruptcy law of Scotland expressed in this document. I do not doubt you. I am not in a position to, to even dream of doubting you apart from the, the legal requirement and by doing so as it were from this end of the table. Um, could I just thank you for confirming that there will be things in here that were not in any way described as bankruptcy when they were first written down, and for example, the pensions. Um, if we were to find that there's something which has crept through, how, would that how could that flow back into this document? Would it have to come through as some kind of statutory instrument to modify this afterwards if we, if, if we did find, the courts found that something had been missing? Well... <laughs> If something's missing, it, it hasn't been got rid of. It, it, it's still sitting there, and uh, um, it's uh, there. The, the, uh, we have provisions uh, towards the end of the bill uh, dealing with continuity of the law, and uh, so where something is, uh, uh, well, we have provisions. It's section two hundred and thirty-five. I'd refer you to. Um, uh, where it, it, it takes account of the fact that something might be done under um, existing provisions if, if uh, these provisions are um, overtaken by provisions of the bill. Nevertheless, the, the, the whole thing is intended to be continuous. I mean, the, 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 these, these subsections, um, which are pretty much in standard form, I mean, they appear in consolidation after consolidation, are, are intended to make sure that things aren't lost and don't just fall away, and that if they, if they refer to the old act, then they will be regarded as referring to the corresponding provisions of the new. We have specifically repealed things that you have specifically consolidated. That, that's right, or that were, were unnecessary, had obviously no further utility. So anything that you've missed will, by definition, not have been repealed because you will have missed it and therefore not repealed it? Yes. Yes, thank you. That's all right. I just wanted to check the logic on that. So that there is anything that, anything that still needs to be there that we might have missed, there, right, that you might have missed, actually will still be there because we can't yeah. have repealed it by accident. Yes. yes. Uh, I mean, just put my hand and start 
one's heart and say there is absolutely nothing that hasn't been lost uh, is, is difficult. But uh, we, we, as far as we are aware, we, we, um, we've done this exercise very thoroughly with a lot of people checking a lot of documents. And uh, it, it's... Uh, not, I would certainly say that nothing has been repealed that ought not to have been repealed. Do you want to come in? Just to get absolute clarity, the purpose of the consolidation is to allow, in total, the repeal of all the enactments that are consolidated. Yes, that's right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, is there anything more that you'd like to say about the inclusion of the trustees within the consolidation? I think it's been probably been adequately discussed as, as protected trustees as being a, a sensible thing to include. <laughs> I, th I think the ma main question is why they were ever out of there. Um, I mean, they are so much the, th the same of the same order of thing as the other provisions of, of the Act, of the 1985 Act. Um, that, uh, the, the, of course, I mean, we're, we're, it's historical, and it happened in uh, um, 2000, 2007. Uh, but. Um, it, it just seems so right that they're in here. Yes. Can I ask about the debt arrangement um, yeah, scheme, Scotland Regulations of 2011, which I don't think are in here. Would there not have been a case for, arguable case for putting those in? They, they, um, that was thought... I, 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 I think I mentioned when I was here before that, uh, that, that as, as Gregor said um, today, that, that really this exercise started based on the, the bankruptcy of Scotland Act 1985. And uh, I mean, I think generally we would accept that the, the debt arrangement scheme, you know, it's a significant um, body of law in its own right. But uh, I, I mean, I think very much we would have seen that as, as you know, part of wider debt law rather than purely bankruptcy or insolvency law, and that you know, I suppose that I don't think on that basis it was ever you know, seriously considered for inclusion in in this statute. I mean, not to say it couldn't be. I mean, for instance, the Insolvency Act 1986, which covers personal insolvency in bankruptcy in England, um, you know, does include the um, does include the. Um, the Personal insolvency and, and some, you know, some, you know, other wider material. For instance, company insolvency material. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's no. And the, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for the law commission, but I think the, the overall genesis of the um, the measures which are included in the debt arrangement scheme, um, you know, the, the the Scottish law commission, you know, I, basically. Um, Entry into the debt arrangement scheme isn't necessarily insolvency, but it may well catch the same debtors who are in a very similar position to insolvency. So, um, I think on that basis, from a you know, Scottish government point of view, we would see it as, as not, you know, not basically about insolvency because it's about people deciding that they want to pay back their debts and that that should uh, should be seen slightly differently. But uh, there's no overriding le legal reason why. That the provisions couldn't be included in the one statute, but I think that's not something that we would take the view as is, is the better approach. Yeah. Th thank you. It's just useful to, to know yeah. where the boundary is and to have on the record that you considered where the boundary should be. So thank you very much. Just one relatively minor point, if I might pick up the um, recommendation one from the Scottish Law Commission um, on consolidation of bankruptcy legislation made comments about the use of right or interest. Um, and I think we've heard from the government on to what extent right or interest are the same thing, or right or interest in land are the same thing. Uh, I'm wondering whether Mr. Clark has any comment as to how he sees that and what he's done with that particular discussion. Please. Uh, certainly, um, th there was an initial feeling that the word right would suffice uh, in all contexts within the bill, but. Uh, Subsequently, um, uh, pract experienced practitioners were rather nervous about this, and they, they were afraid that something might be lost with relation to some of the provisions, just a, just a, a small number of them. And I think the, uh, the uh, co commissioners were, were happy to, to compromise and, and to, uh, to, to take account of the, 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 the possible uncertainties. Uh, and. Uh, it was very hard to be to form a complete picture of whether 
one view was whether the, the, the uncertainties were justified, but it was thought it was much safer uh, to, to preserve the wording in a number of the provisions. Thank you. That's, uh, that's helpful. Um, I think we're back to Richard, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the <coughs> definition of debt advice and information package has been moved to the interpretation section of the bill, and that doesn't appear to be consistent with the approach to taken to other definitions used in parts one to four, which are restated where they appear in the 1985 Act. So could you explain uh, why you've taken uh, th uh, this uh, approach regarding, regarding the definition of debt advice and information package? Yes, I think um, my whole approach here was based on Section 5 of the 1985 Act, which had really um, become something of a monster. Uh, there, there were so many subsections, um, and one of the ways of perhaps getting rid of some of the material uh, on an initial view was to, was to take a, de a definition of that kind and put it into the, put it with the rest of the definitions um, in the interpretation section. User friendly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, it was just generally part of this whole business of breaking up Section 5 into smaller units. Um, I think having a look at how it's turned out, I, I would not be unhappy to see in Section 3, which of course is a, another part of the original Section 5 of the 1985 Act, uh, include the definition. I think, I think that's something that could certainly be regarded with, with sympathy and we, we, we could. We could uh, reinsert the, the, the uh, definition um, subsection. Apart from that, anything else would give more, more substance to what's a very small section at the moment. So you might, so you might actually reconsider, consider um, changing your approach on that sort of specific. Yes. It's, it's not a huge point, as you say, but if, 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 if you say it, it might be something you give further consideration to. Yes, I, I mean, I think it actually it's a good point and, and it would be perfectly reasonable to bring it forward there. And the original purpose of putting it into the interpretation provisions is really gone now that uh, we've broken up Section 5 so much. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And, and generally, can you explain the approach taken to the definitions used in the bill and where these are uh, defined? Is the approach taken consistent overall? Uh, or if it's not consistent overall, is there some particular reason for, uh, you know, for, for, for um, uh, taking an, an inconsistent approach? Normally, the user of a statute is going to look to the interpretation mm -hmm. section for anything coming up. And uh, I think uh, his, his, they, they will find uh, most... Uh, provisions def at least referred to there, the, 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 at least uh, the, the section in which a definition is presented is referred to in the interpretation section. But just occasionally you, you come across a really a very important element of the bill, something that really is a block to understanding if you don't explain it at the moment it's occurring. Uh, and the, the, so, so some of the really important uh, concepts and identities um, are uh, defined as one comes to them. I mean, qualified creditors, uh, Section 7 of the Bill, for example, is very much worth defining where it's occurring because it's so important to understanding the whole provision. And the is, this is not a definition, a, a sort of bolt-on. This is where the definition is of the very essence of the thing that is being described. So the priority has been to make sure the Bill can be easily used the legislation understood in, in, in most accessible ways. That That's right. Uh, and if, if you overdo it by putting too many definitions yeah. into the text before you come to them, then it becomes a very dull read, if anyone ever do, does read it from start to finish. <laughs> sure, we'll all be reading it page to page. Thank you, Mr. Clark. But I, mean, I like the concept that one might. I mean, if you try drafting the statute in such a way that you could read it from beginning to end and, and, you know, and, and get sense out of it, then I, that seems like an admirable way of drafting a statute. Um, Thank you. Uh, I think that takes us on to John Mason, is that right? Okay. Thanks, uh, Convener. Um, you, you mentioned earlier on the word forthwith, so that's what I wanted to just spend a little bit of time uh, asking you about, because I, mean, I completely accept that the two of the principles you're trying to deal with here are, on the one hand, consistency, and on the other, trying to have language which is maybe a bit archaic uh, brought up to date. And I suppose my question is, I mean, the word forthwith was was used throughout the bill previously, or the act, previous act, sorry, um, and that was consistent. You've now replaced that in, I think, most cases with the phrase without delay. However, in section 22, um, 
you've, you've left it as forthwith. So, so now it would appear there's an inconsistency which wasn't there before. Can, can you just give us your thinking behind all of that? <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I, I, I start from the basis that forthwith is a word that one wouldn't ordinarily use in standard English. I mean, it's, you don't tell people to do things forthwith anymore uh, unless you're being humorous. Um, but uh, in Section 22, the, it's a word that's been argued over. I mean, does it mean... It, obviously, it's, there's an element of immediacy in the word, but does it mean without delay, in which case you get the whole argument about what constitutes delay, or does it mean there and then? Um, with something, a process of the nature of sequestration, there must be very few instances where it's absolutely vital that something is done at once. Um, it's, it's an administrative process. Um, the sheriff uh, needs time to think, needs to, time to come to his decisions. It, uh, so, um, in some ways, forthwith, Forthwith, of course, I, I, as I referred in a, a note to the committee, has these two meanings. I mean, it either means at once or it means without delay. And I think the, 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 the whole argument in section, what's presently section 22 of the bill, has been around that, uh, the point that it, if it means without delay, how, what is delay? Um, how, how long a period can intervene? And there have just been so many um, contradictions and different views taken. Uh, it, it would be nice to, to settle it and say it does mean at once or it does mean without delay. But the, the question in the context of that section is, is, is in the air and we shouldn't really in a consolidation be settling the question. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think we should be forced either into using the word forthwith anywhere else in the bill. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not a, a major issue in other provisions. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to modernise the language generally, but nevertheless to take account of the fact that as a, the distinction has a particular importance just in that one section. OK, I mean, I understand what you're saying about section 22. And, I mean, they both seem to me quite vague terms, but I, I think from what you're saying, forthwith, in a sense, is vaguer or wider than without delay. I suppose that then raises the question in my mind, it, are we certain that everywhere else in the, in the previous legislation where it said forthwith, nobody was too worried about it, and therefore the slight change to the tighter term without delay is not impacting on the law in any of these other sections? I, I think one has to, to, to come to a sort of view as to what, what one's dealing with as a, as a whole process here. Um, I think um, talk of uh, uh, without, without delay as being a, a, a tighter term, I think, is, is, is not quite right. It's just, it's just that forthwith has been open to different constructions. I, I, I'm, in almost every other instance, without delay uh, carries a, a, a meaning um, that uh, I, I don't think anyone is going to, is going to um, be in any doubt about. Um, it's, it's an administrative process. It means get on with it, don't hang about. Um, but it's, somehow um, it, it's... it's um, the whole idea of doing something at once is is is, uh, is a is a difficult thing to to, to say that, that would have been an adequate um, substitution um, throughout the bill. The, without delay seems a much more natural, uh, having regard to the the whole process and the and the way in which things are done. That it really there isn't any litigation on the subject, and therefore nobody's greatly exercised about it in any other place. I, I think that's right. Yes. Yes. And therefore, without delay, seems to encapsulate uh, what, what we believe it's, we it's, know, but nobody's ever challenged it, so it maybe well, just doesn't matter. Well, that's right. It's, it's, a, it's a modern way of expressing forthwith, uh, but we, we have to take account of the fact that people have, have in very narrow contexts, um, tried to argue that it is, it is a much, it's a much more urgent word than without, without delay. Yes. Okay. 
I mean, we could go on all day in this probably, and I don't think it's a tidy solution. So I think we just have to accept that, and I'm not really challenging the solution that you've come up with. I suppose just the very fact that we have changed forthwith elsewhere to without delay implies that this forthwith does not mean without delay. It means something else. And, you know, I suppose my fear by way of comment is that, you know, the courts could look at the, a difference and, and think that we're trying to say something here, but I'm not sure there is a tidy answer. Well, well, that's right. I mean, I've agonised over this. Um, uh, <laughs> but I think the, the first thing the, the court is going to do is, is that they're going to look at the Oxford Dictionary and they're going to find both meanings given instantly or without delay. Um, and uh, I think they are going to be very well aware that, um, uh, that, first of all, that consolidation is not trying to, do any, to change anything, uh, because that's one of the sort of rules of... And, and I think they will, they will be uh, aware, too, that this is a provision that has been argued over and the solutions have not been found, and that there is a reason, therefore, for keeping the word forth with and waiting for the courts to define in some definitive... to come to some... Uh, answer as to, uh, as to what is to be preferred here. Okay, right. Thanks very much. Thank you indeed. Uh, John, please. Uh, convener, uh, can I just take you to consequential amendments in section 16 of the bill, please? And in written questions, we asked for an explanation that, as to why section 16 of the bill goes further than the equivalent provision of the 1985 Act, specifically at subsection 6 and 7 B of section 16. It would be helpful for the committee if you could explain on why this approach has been taken in the bill, please. Sorry. Um, I haven't quite focused on this here. If it's worth me saying that in, in terms of, um, you know, let Gregor think about the, the bill itself, but it, I, mean, I think this issue goes to, to a, you know, a missed consequential amendment, um, which was identified in, the, uh, in the, the, the way in which the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014 picked up on the material that, the, that was in the the wider consolidation bill, which the Law Commission had had published, um, and there are, you know, as the, the committee have very usefully pointed out, there are uh, there are minor omissions in the way in which that was done, uh, and for that reason, the bill by uh, the consolidation bill by adopting the previous approach has, has followed through on the intended approach to consolidation, and that's uh, you know, and that's. That's something which, you know, I think the the, the best approach would be to to correct those um, those minor emissions. Um, the, the the bill comes forward obviously as a consolidation bill, and this is reflect reflects recommendations um, four and five of the the law commission's original recommendations, and, and for that reason we. I, Certainly, don't see a, a difficulty with the, the bill adopting that approach. Um, you know, the, the other issue also is, I suppose, the extent to which the, the current law, sh you know, should be updated as well in order for the, the consolidation to be a, a pure consolidation, and, and we would see some merit in, in these cases in, in doing that as well. Um, you know, obviously, a timing issue with, in terms of uh, putting through um, through the um, the the very you know minor changes in order to pave the way for that but um, but certainly i think i think there would be merit in that so. could, could you Sorry. just talk a little further about yeah. the alternative route which would involve the scottish government making the necessary consequential amendments under section 55 if we're talking about the same thing of the 2014 yes, act rather than directly into the bill and can you expand on how this would work and the timings that might be involved Yes, I mean it's affirmative procedure. So, um, but it's a very short, very short order just to, to change these the two very, very short points. Um, and so, you know, so that could be done. I mean, I, I would say I don't see any difficulties at all with the with the bill proceeding as drafted because it, that reflects the commission's recommendations in any event. So. 
don't doubt you in any way. We just would seek your reassurance that um, there, you don't feel there's any risk that these changes could be changes to the law which should properly fall outside the scope of the consolidation. It's certainly, if the change was made, there would be there would be no prospect of that at all. Um, for the rest, if there are commission recommendations, minor changes to the law are you know are possible in that. You know, so on that basis, as an alternative, if you like that, you know that would. That, that would be within the scope of the consolidation exercise. Thanks. That's great. Thanks Is there much. not an arguable case, though, that if they weren't, if the, these changes weren't made when they should have been, that Parliament meant not to make them? We know it was inadvertent, but nonetheless, you could argue that it was something that Parliament did not do, and therefore we shouldn't now be picking them up in a consolidation bill because we should have picked them up then and we didn't and therefore we meant not to and therefore they shouldn't now properly be consolidated. I, I think there is an arguable case but uh, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, certainly my view and you know, like Gregor, uh, you know, come back, but, but certainly it, on, in, the, in these particular contexts I think it's, it's reasonably clear that, that the um, I think one of the provisions in any event is, is merely a for the avoidance of doubt provision where yeah. there, there wouldn't be any difficulty. The other one I think there would be benefit to making clear, but in any event I would certainly hope that the courts would come to the right, the right conclusion if they ever had to, to look at it. I, I, I guess you'll understand though that one yeah. of the things that does concern us as a committee is yeah. that we would prefer the courts didn't have the opportunity of coming to the right decision. Yes, no, I much prefer yeah. the law to be so yes. unambiguous, if uh, be more than one yeah. ambiguous, that, that it's clear that the court doesn't need to make that decision. Yeah. The, the, the I guess that would be our default. The, the, the law would certainly be, be clear after the consolidation, but I quite take, take, take the point, and that, you know, as I say, I think there'd be benefit in amending the law in any event. Well, uh, no. well certainly, um, I'm sorry, I was slightly thrown there, but uh, the, 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 these. Um, uh, changes, of course, would be made in an order under the 2014 Act and to take account of things that ought to have been done in the 2014 Act to the 1985 Act. Um, so, uh, I mean, that is, a, I think, clearly the sounder way to go because apart from anything else, uh, the provisions of the 1985 Act will still have some application in relation to transitional provisions and in uh, relation to um, the, 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 uh, uh, to, to, to proceedings that are currently uh, are currently continuing. Um, so it, it, I, I think the, the, it is certainly very desirable to, uh, to for, uh, if it proves practicable for the government to, to, to uh, use the, the provisions made for these sort of consequential amendments, the ancillary provision. Uh, section 55 of the 2014 Act. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it would be very unfortunate if uh, uh, the consequential provisions that were in the uh, Commission's own bill, uh, and which were part of the package to, to implement the recommendations, if, 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 they were, if they were just missed altogether, um, because they, they, they are um, it's, it's, it's very hard to say why, why on earth would you only mention some paragraphs and, 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 and not others. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that they were missed, but I think the, the whole thing is easily, it can easily be remedied. I suspect uh, that's going to be interesting for the government to read that on the record. I suspect we're going to be suggesting that the government does just to make sure that there is nothing else to argue about, but that's for very much the, the, the proper way to go, provided, I mean, as I say, it is practical from the point of view of business management and so on. Okay, let's leave that there, thank you. I think the government will reflect on that. Um, could I take you to the subject of and and or? Um, I suspect the youngsters are now in the gallery are wondering what parliamentary committee discusses the meaning of the word and and or, but it's this one. Um, and it's because its meaning in legislation is hugely important, as Mr. Clark doesn't need me to tell him. Our advisers have pointed out to us that there are maybe one or two inconsistencies in the bill, but there's also a general point about whether or not Tom, Dick, or Harry is the preferred, in, in the grand scale of things, the preferred way of drafting legislation. Now, you've quite clearly made your position clear, and, and, and I respect that. But I'm just wondering whether 
the suggestion that I think we're getting from Christ, which that, and generally speaking, it should be a list separated by semicolons, does have some merit, except where there is a specific reason for doing something different. And I wonder whether you might like to reflect on the general principle of that. It, uh, I mean, I would regard it as a matter of standard English. If, if one strips out the paragraphing and has a continuing line of texts, then the ands and ors are needed. I mean, it's a, it's a way you would construct large, complex sentences. You, you um, certainly wouldn't have repeated ors and repeated ands with every, with every item. And the and or or in a list of things in a, in a, in a long, complex English sentence uh, tends to be just for the between the final units. Sorry, I, I don't think that's any anything that we would dispute. Yes, I, I think the the question and the logicians among us worry about this great deal is that if you have a list of three or four things, then if you put an or at the end, it may be that those above it have to go together, and it's only the last one which is the or. Now, I think we know in normal English that's not generally speaking the case, but would it not be prudent perhaps in the context in which we're talking to, to, to separate all the ones which if you've got a list of things which can be done separately you could pick and choose any of them all are allowable particularly in the context of a power would it not be wiser to make clear that those powers are all separately available but need not be put together in such a way that this 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 or this does not mean the first threes or the last this is very much a, a, a way in, w in which uh, statutes are interpreted and uh, the, the way in which they're f formed. I mean, you go right through the statute book and you'll find the practice I'm following here is, is pretty much the standard form. Uh, occasionally, ands and ors are missed. There are, I mean, there are various ways of expressing things, but uh, the, 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 the absence of... Uh, I mean, essentially, one is, is reading this as one would read any passage of English. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very much the form of the um, 1985 Act itself. Um, I, I would find it extremely odd to, to, to take any other approach than I've used here. Um, occasionally, one can introduce provisions by saying uh, any or all of the following or... Um, uh, but, but I mean, that's that's usually done only whether it could there could, there could be some sort of doubt as to um, whether that's the case or not. Uh, um, I, I mean, I I, I I I find it very hard to adjust to the, to the idea that one would 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 draft these provisions differently. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering. Uh, I don't want to extend this discussion now. I think it's one which we might just want to, to, to put down on paper and, and be, be clearer and reflective about. But if I were to take you to paragraph 103, subsection 4, I think that's right. Yeah, section 103. Sorry, what did I say? Forgive me. Section 103, subsection 4. I think it's intended to mean that the Secretary of State can make provision on A and he can make provision on B. And he could do one or the other or both. But they're separated by an or. Yes. yes. Um, well, in that case, um, you... you um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the fact is that the, the, this power can be used on more than one occasion. Um, uh, it, it can be uh, used in, in part. I mean, the, 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 he, he could do one and then the other because he's, he's not obliged to do it on just a, a single occasion. Um, there's, a, there's no suggestion that because he's done it once using paragraph A that he can't then do it using paragraph B. Okay, forgive me. I'm just wondering what the or adds because would there not be many statutes where it's not there at all? 
So are you saying that there are, there are statutes where it's not there at all? That would be my suggestion. And if that's the case, then I'm just wondering, and forgive me, I know, I know we are picking over that, but, but what does the or add, and therefore is there a risk that it might tell the court something that it wouldn't be told if the or weren't there? I, I, I really can't see this, this being misconstrued. Um, okay. I mean, we'd have to go through the statute book, striking out ors all over the yeah. place. And, yeah. uh, okay, thank you. But, I mean, it's, it, it's a power. It's a, it's a power that's given to the Secretary of State. He, he can do both. He can do... I mean, he's, he's, not, he's not obliged just to do one of these things because in any event he could come round... He, he could... <laughs> There would be no logic in that because you could just come straight along and do the other. It's, no, nobody could construe this as banning him from doing, having made one choice of, yeah. of stopping him from making the other. Thank you. That's okay. Um, are you, did you want? I, I just take issue in one relatively narrow sense that the word or has two specific and different meanings, which are in conflict with each other, potentially. Now, not necessarily in terms of where law is drafted, not even perhaps necessarily in plain English, but certainly in the mathematical world in which I have been trained, in that or can mean one or both, or it can in some circumstances mean only one of. Now, of course, in mathematics, to distinguish between the two uses of or, the latter meaning is normally expressed as X or, in other words, exclusive or. Only one is permitted, not both. And, but, but that distinction that is made in mathematics is precisely because, in plain English, it is ambiguous when you use the word or as to which is intended. And that's, in a sense, perhaps why there is a residual discomfort about the use of the, the word or without an explanation of what or means in the circumstances in which it might be used. Yes, I mean, I, I think you do have to look at the context. So, uh, what I was saying was in that particular context, it couldn't be read. It, it just wouldn't make sense because the, 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 there is the, the, the power of the Secretary of State to... to, to um, to, to use a power more than once and, and uh, I mean I, I could not possibly think of a situation where because he'd used it once in one way he couldn't then come back and use the other part of it let me, let me posit that it could mean that the Secretary of State required if he wished to legislate for both the subparagraphs he would have to do so via two separate instruments and did not acquire the power to put the two bits in a single instrument. In other words, he would need to exercise each on a single occasion, there being no restriction on how many occasions he can exercise these powers, but there might arguably be a restriction on whether he can exercise them together, depending on your interpretation of the meaning of the word or. Now, I say all this not to actually cause us to reach a conclusion, but to illustrate, at least in my mind, that the use of the word or is ambiguous because its definition is not clearly stated. Yes, I, I mean, I can, I can, can un understand what, what you're saying, but I think the ambiguity would be solved in this case by the fact that, you know, what, what, what could Parliament possibly have contended by uh, this if, if it, it, I mean, it really requiring them to come back on, on two different occasions with two different documents? Well, I, I, think, I, I, I think this is my final contribution on this matter because we have perhaps more substantive matters to concern ourselves with. But the very fact that we are discussing what is it that Parliament might have intended illustrates the ambiguity that might exist through the use of the word in this context. But I, I really am not looking for a particular response. That's perhaps all I would say. Okay, I think that's, forgive us, but that's one of the things that does slightly concern us, and I could point to a number of sections where that, that might cause a problem. But I think I'm clear, Mr. Clark, that you're suggesting that courts would not find that a problem, and I'm grateful for that advice. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our questions at this stage, unless I've missed anything. So can I thank you very much for your attendance uh, and I'll briefly suspend this meeting to allow you
uh, to leave us and uh, perhaps the rest of us to find a cup of tea if that's all right for two minutes. Okay, the next item is agenda item four, which again is the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill, and this is for the committee to consider whether the consolidation in parts nine to fourteen of the bill correctly restates the enactments being consolidated, and also whether the consolidation is clear, coherent, and consistent. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the drafter of the bill in written correspondence. It appears that the reference in section 1197 to subsection 75A should be to subsection 6A. Does the committee agree to draw this to the drafter's attention, please? Thank yes. you. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter, one, why in section 168 one reference to a living individual is retained, while the other such reference is restated as an individual, and two, whether there is any reason for this difference in terminology? The wording of section 1701 of the bill is relevant to determining the date by which documents must be sent to creditors under this section. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter, one, why the words not later than seven days after registration in Regulation 10 of the Protected Trustees Scotland Regulations 2013 
hereafter the 2013 regulations have been restated as not later than seven days after the date of publication in section 171 of the bill and two is this considered to have any effect on the meaning of the provision yes. thank you section 184 Six appears to contain a drafting error as follows. That section provides that the letter of discharge does not discharge the debtor from D affect the rights of a secured creditor. Does the committee agree to draw this to the drafter's attention? Yes. Thank you. Wording of section 186. Eight of the bill is relevant to determining the time by which the discharge trustee must perform various duties under this section. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter, one, why the words within 28 days of the date of discharge in Regulation 25.7 of the 2013 regulations are changed to without delay in Section 1868 of the bill? And two, what effect this is considered to have on the meaning of the provision? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item five. Again, the Bankruptcy Bill Scotland, the purpose of this item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill at stage one. If members are content with the recommendations in the paper which we've seen, this will form the basis of a report to Parliament. The draft report will not be discussed by the committee before it's published. Is the committee content with the delegated powers are restated unchanged and continued in the consolidation? Is the committee content with the delegated powers which are modified or created as a result of the consolidation? Yes. yes. Thank you. Agenda item six, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by legal advisers on the General Dental Council Fitness to Practice, etc., Order 2015 draft, nor the Public Appointments in Public Bodies, etc., Scotland Act 2003, Treatment of Community Justice Scotland as Specified Authority, Order 2016 draft, nor on the Secure Accommodation Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 draft. Is the committee content with these, please? Yes. <coughs> Agenda item seven, instruments subject to negative procedure, and no points have been re re raised by our legal advisers on the Plant Health Import Inspection Fees Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 392, nor the Animal Byproducts Miscellany Amendment Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 393, nor the Litigants in Person Costs and Expenses Sheriff Appeal Court Order 2015, SSI 2015 398, nor the Trading Animals and Related Products Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 411. Sorry, 401. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Yes, Gender item eight is the Land Reform Scotland Bill. This item of business is for the committee to consider the Scottish Government's response to its stage one report. Do members have any comments, please? Stuart? Um, convener, I think uh, the, 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 the Government uh, continues to have significant powers that will only come into being uh, when secondary legislation is brought forward. Um, and, and I think that continues to be a matter of concern. Uh, clearly, uh, we can take a judgment on what is before us in relation uh, specifically to ECHR, uh, but we will continue, I think, to be properly exercised uh, about what the process of scrutiny should be when these powers are brought forward uh, in due course of secondary legislation. So I, th I think the government should uh, take notice of our desire to ensure that we have more opportunity, perhaps, than the standard process uh, to consider ECHR in relation to secondary legislation. And I think that's the overarching point that there is uh, on the bill as it currently stands. Do, do members concur with that? And John? Yes, I, I would agree with uh, all that Stuart Stevenson has said, perhaps a, a little more uh, strongly than him. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a great concern, the number of um, areas that are still under policy development. It's of great concern um, the fact that um, powers are being taken um, instead of being put on the face of the bill as a substitute for legislation being put on the face of the bill that will be introduced uh, subsequently in terms of secondary legislation uh, and therefore uh, subject and liable to much less parliamentary scrutiny. That is a, a current theme uh, right through um, um, parts of the bill. I have particular concerns about part 10 of the bill um, and I, th I think that's um, 
really very poor in, in, in how it has thus far been um, put together. Uh, my particular concern um, is that this bill has the capacity, as it's currently drafted, to bring our Parliament into disrepute um, because of the very many um, issues there are under ECHR where it, it apparently uh, uh, is not ECHR um, non-compliant, but nor is it ECHR compliant. Uh, and, and as Stuart Stevenson said, we do not have the ability, uh, we this committee do not have the ability to, to scrutinise that, which is a matter of great regret. And therefore the potential, the huge potential exists um, to, to bring Parliament into disrepute, um, which I would not wish to see. That's why I think we have to um, certainly make our views known in the strongest possible terms. And we have already once been rebuked by a correct court of session um, in this area of law um, for not making um, ECHR compliant legislation. I would not wish to see that happen again. And what particularly concerns me is, is the apparent, uh, in terms of the, the tone and indeed the content of the response that we've received um, from government, is a lack of, of, a, of a willingness to address the points that we have raised. Um, this is a matter of, of, of great regret. And I have to say, I've only been on this committee for five years or thereby, but I do not recall any previous instances when the government have taken such a cavalier view of, of, the, of, the, of the suggestions that we have properly made as part of this committee to government. Um, uh, and so that's a matter of great concern to me. Thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, my comment would be that, um, I mean, there is always a balance to be struck between what is in the face of the bill and what is in the secondary legislation. And I think the committee is, is disappointed that, in, the, in this case, compared to other legislation, there appears to be less on the face of the bill and more being left uh, for secondary legislation. Uh, so I think that would be, for, for me, that's the key point. Well, we have, of course, already written to the government. I think the suggestion here is that we pursue these various issues and the comments that members have just made uh, directly with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and the Environment and the Minister for Environment, Climate Change and, and Law Reform and Land Law Reform. Um, are members happy for me to, to write in the appropriate terms yes. on your behalf? Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, that completes agenda item eight and the public part of this meeting. So. We'll move into private. Thank you very much.